welcome to An Evening with Nirvana. It's a podcast where I talk to a series of guests from the Dune community, maybe some people outside of it about things like level design, map creation, uh, other facets of game development. Today I'm here with No Reason, who you'll probably know for his challenging slaughter maps, starting with his early releases, Disparate Realities, and Death in Excess, as well as the No Reason speed maps projects, of which there are now three, uh, and the gigantic Cosmogenesis. Uh, he's also an okay player, in my opinion. How are you doing today, No Reason? Uh, hey, what's up? Uh, we're doing a podcast. That's what's up. Yeah, I can, I can see that. It's uh, <laughs> exciting. Yeah. But uh, uh, yeah, I'm okay. That's good. Uh, so I asked this question to everybody, uh, the boring one. How did you uh, originally get into Doom? Um, that's, uh, so I was very young. Mm-hmm. I think it was like, I must have been like five or something. And my, my dad had the, um, the like collector's edition that had like Doom, uh, Doom 2 and Final Doom. And then like a preview of Doom 3. Oh, wow. And that's, and that's kind of how I got into it. I was so terrified of doom though that i could barely play it until i was like until i was probably like 10 or 11 like i was too scared to really (laughs) play it seriously up until then so yeah i got into it at a very young age that was probably like 2005 or something when i was eight or something maybe even earlier than that oh wow okay i didn't actually realize you were uh, that young i I, uh... yeah i mean i'm 25 so Interesting, yeah. Because having a preview of Doom 3 on it, that, that's a first for the podcast, I think. Yeah. <laughs> it's usually like, well, my... I mean, obviously it was after Doom 3 came out, but but right. uh, yeah, we didn't get that until a little later. And then when I got Doom 3, it was I was too scared to even play it, so... <laughs> well, that's fair. It was pretty terrifying when it came out. Um, so when did when did you start actually making maps then? That must have come quite a, a lot later. Uh, that was like 2010, actually. Oh, okay. After I saw like some demos of Sunder, mm-hmm. and uh, I saw those maps, and I was like, I, I was astounded by the the detail and the scale of those maps. And so, uh, you know, I started looking up some some uh, tutorials and stuff, and. Uh, came across a guy named Chubb Stumer. <laughs> and uh, right, that yeah. was kind of how I got started with the the basics of, of Doom mapping. Mm-hmm. But, you know, I didn't release anything for a long time, and it wasn't anything I really focused on because I was so young, and yeah. I didn't really care that much about it until later on. Mm-hmm. Which uh, which of the Iwads sort of did you enjoy the most when you played through them? And probably Final Doom. I was would it, say. Was this one of the ones where it was like uh, you I just picked from a yeah. selection of the maps so you weren't sure what was TNT and what was Plutonia kind of thing? Um, honestly, it was it was really weird back in the day because I, I had the... Uh, like, I played on <laughs> Doom 95. <laughs> yeah. So, um, yeah, I, I didn't play, like, level by level. Sometimes I would just go, yeah, like, uh, to a random level and play it or something. Right. But I wasn't really that enamored with the the iWads. But if I had to say, it would point to Plutonia. Mm-hmm. So you didn't really get like, you didn't really start to love Doom until until you saw like custom content. Yeah, yeah, and that's when I really started to get into it. Like I was like, oh, I can map for this. I can make stuff. And like, um, yeah, that's kind of when I started getting much more into it. Rather mm-hmm. than just, oh, it's a game that I sometimes play and I'm terrified of it. Right. <laughs> what what other games were you playing uh, around that time? Were you, like, into FPS generally or, or not Not necessarily? Uh, despite being into Doom, I'm not, like, a huge FPS person. Like, I never cared for, at least old school FPS. Like, I never cared for, like, Duke Nukem or, or Blood or mm-hmm. Rise of the Triad or any of that stuff. It was mostly just Doom. But uh, I I was starting to play TF2, which is another FPS. Yeah. And um, I played some, like, Star Wars RTS games. I was really into Star Wars back then. 
So I just played a lot of Star Wars games. Interesting. Excited to see the Star Wars Total Conversion for Doom that you're working on. <laughs> <laughs> He's not working on one, by the way. Uh, so was di- what was like was Disparate Realities the first thing that you actually created for Doom? Or uh, no, no, not not even not even close. But it's the it? first thing. It's the first thing that I. Actually, it's not even the first thing I released, but it's the first thing that I released on Doom World. Okay, right. Yeah, see, I'm always and, working with partial <laughs> information. A little bit. Yeah, well, the story with that one is kind of like a long story, but basically a lot of those maps were old from like 2014, uh, 2016 or whatever that I kind of put together. And I was like, these are kind of playable. And... um I made two maps specifically for that wad, but most of those are are older maps that I kind of touched up, and I, I was like, yeah, these are these are doable. Mm-hmm. So map three and map thirty two are maps that I made specifically for that release. They aren't they don't come from any older stuff that I made. But everything else is from older stuff. Yeah, that I just never released. So what did your like your first kind of maps look like? Did you were you like emulating the iwads or were you already trying to sort of emulate Sunder and stuff? Uh, I think they kind of emulated a little bit of Hell Revealed. Oh, okay. I was using Hell Revealed midis and stuff like that with the the Rise of the Triad stuff. Mm-hmm. At the time, I didn't know they came from Rise of the Triad, but yeah. Um, and I think I even made like the Path Three at some point. I don't know if I still have that map lying around anywhere. It's <laughs> just right. But yeah, a lot of those older maps are pretty bad, and uh, I lost a lot of them, unfortunately, but I think I still have a few lying around somewhere, but I just haven't looked at them in years and years. Mm-hmm. Well, I went back and I played some of uh, Disparate Realities just to get kind of a sense of it, um, and like map one definitely feels <laughs> a lot like Sunder, and... Uh, were you aware of, like, Bemused at this point when you were making Disparate Realities? Uh, when I was making it, no. Okay. Because it definitely... Uh, I mean, it feels Bemused-like uh, already, Yeah, even though apparently you weren't aware of it. But, um, I don't know. Something about the open sandboxiness of some of the maps with the sort of macro slaughter elements and the Sunder influence and stuff. Definitely kindred spirits with uh, Bemused. Yeah, I I didn't become aware of Bemused until. So there was a streamer named A Mackert who yeah, occasionally know. streams some Doom. He doesn't. He's not a Doom streamer, but he has streamed Doom before. And I became aware of him through his Sunder Let's Plays on YouTube, and mm-hmm. I was I saw those on the recommended once a long time ago, and I was like, who would be crazy enough to do Let's Plays in this one? <laughs> so that's how I, I started watching him. And eventually, uh, at some point, we got into talking about mapping. And uh, he encouraged me to to like release my own stuff. And so he was testing them. And there was one stream where he was testing these maps. And Bemused whispered me on Twitch. And uh, he offered to to test them. So that's how I became aware of them after the WAD was already mostly finished. So Was this Disparate Realities? Yeah, it was just oh, okay, yeah. Because I do remember Bemuse talking about you actually, uh, all the way back then, and saying yeah. like, "Oh, I'm testing maps for this guy," and he's like, really promising and like <laughs> making really cool stuff. So, uh, I was aware of you vicariously through Bemused before you even yeah, released that stuff. Yeah, that was like late 2018 or something like that. Hmm. Crazy to think that was four years ago now. Yeah, it does feel like a while ago. Uh, which is strange. Uh, it feels also, I don't know, I got a lot of Todd vibes, but my, I would guess that you, there's no way you would have been aware of Time of Death uh, if if you were sort of just getting into Slaughter stuff, I would imagine. Um, back in 2018? Yeah, for Disparate Realities. No, I was I was definitely aware of, of Time of Death. And all oh, you the, were? Yeah, I had played... Uh, Slaughterfest 2011 and 2012 um, at that point. I don't remember when I first played them. It was a while ago. And, um, you know, Time of Death stuff always sort of uh, interested me, I guess, because the maps looked crazy. Mm -hmm. And uh, sometimes you had crazy music in them, like the grassy. (laughs) Yeah. 
So it was always sort of, uh, it was just interesting. They were, they stood out a lot compared to some of the other maps. But I don't know if I purposefully emulated his stuff in that in in disparate realities. It might have been like a subconscious inspiration sort of thing. Uh-huh. But uh, there there are definitely other ones where I've, uh, other maps where I've um, more closely been inspired by this stuff. Yeah, because like map map two of that one is like visually obviously Sunder influenced, <laughs> pretty obviously, but. Uh, it has like loose monster placement and like these stacks of perched vials around and then like random masterminds and it really made me think of uh some of uh todd's maps uh from like eternal slumber party and and stuff like that which i guess mm. are compilations from other words but that's what i've mostly played of his but just that kind of loose uh slaughter feeling of like connected rooms and uh big packs of monsters but not necessarily like fixed lock-ins and, and things like that yeah i think part of that comes from armored blood stuff like new gothic uh, movement a lot of those maps are just kind of open do whatever yeah you're not really locked in in a lot of places so i was inspired by by those as well a, a little less so than like sunder but <laughs> still they did have a impact on me yeah Armored Blood's a good call, actually, for sure. Uh, Disparate Realities, uh, it sort of shows off, like, the early stages of your open map design. What do you like about, like, sandboxy open maps, especially with, like, very spicy openings? Um, I just like how insane they can get. I love a good spectacle in a map. Like, it just, if there's projectiles flying around everywhere, monsters... Uh, you know, in fighting with each other, and you just don't know <laughs> like what's happening. Mm-hmm. I feel like that's really it can be funny and exciting, and I I really enjoy that sort of thing. I don't do it all the time because it can be exhausting to go map after map when that's happening, but I do enjoy that from time to time for sure. Yeah, and, and um, obviously I enjoy the the aspect of being able to uh, like kind of pick your poison where you go in a map. Mm-hmm. So that's that's cool as well. Yeah. I think well Death and Excess seems to have uh it seems to get more into like the combat puzzly kind of gameplay uh than maybe disparate realities. Were you playing certain wads around that time that made you want to move into doing that kind of stuff a bit more? Um I don't think so. I I I really I, this death and excess was just a a result of otex coming out i saw this cool texture pack that was new and i was like i gotta use this and that's kind of that's kind of just how that happened right it, it inspired me to just start making stuff with that so it wasn't really like a conscious decision uh like the gameplay style most of the time no there were there were some maps that were like um map 14 uh i would say was inspired by no health from uh time of death Mm -hmm. because there's very little health in that map so i was like well you know let's see how how far we can stretch the limits of this this idea very limited health not exactly no health but you know right i i feel like there's still that like mix of sunder and time of death in there and then I don't know. <laughs> I felt like visually there were like some maps that reminded me of like Russian kind of slaughter mapping as well. Uh, were you going for like any particular themes or like vibes with the word uh, visually? Uh, sometimes in some maps, I mean, every map I would pick like a kind of theme I wanted before I really started mapping. But there were some maps where this was more difficult, like map four. I had a hard time picking out what I wanted. So it just kind of ends up looking weird but uh most of the time there was a specific thing that i wanted mm-hmm. before i started mapping and but it, it wasn't a universal thing it was just like per map basis i guess it was a lot of it also just sort of like what does Otex have to offer what can i do for this map using Otex kind of thing yeah yeah i was like well i gotta use this thing to its full potential i mean there's so many different 
choices here so you, you have to do it justice at least that's what i was thinking mm -hmm. <laughs> one thing that's notable about uh death and excess and and a lot of your stuff maybe not so much now but i i feel like you're a lover of floor vials which uh I feel like the the conversations concerning them in like the slaughter community these days aren't exactly super positive. Do you think that floor vials still have a place uh, in slaughter encounters? Uh, yeah, I do. But I feel like you have to be more intelligent with their placement these days to get a enjoyable experience because it's been done so many times that mm -hmm. people are going to see that and just get tired of it or you know be like oh well i know where this is going i'm gonna have to grind them down or whatever or i'm gonna have to rush them and i do like rushing vials but uh yeah i feel like just the prevalence of them these days turns people off to that so i can understand why but i think they can still be used just sparingly i guess and huge amounts like you can have small amounts of vials and it's it's fine but yeah huge floor vial groups is uh, i feel like uh more of a bad choice these days yeah i mean i do find that like when i make maps i like more and more these days i have like a list of tropes in my head that i try to avoid almost like you don't want like the slow caco swarm you don't want yeah you know, like a bunch of floor vials like, there are certain things that you think about where you're like, ah, oh, this has been done, like, a hundred times. Do you, <laughs> do you find that you also, like, go through a big list of tropes when you're making uh, encounters to avoid? I didn't, I didn't used to, but I think after, um, like, when I was making No SP3, I started doing that. Mm -hmm. I was like, ah, oh, I've just did this in the last map, and I, people have seen this a billion times, so let me try something else. And it, it makes it more difficult to, like, <laughs> get ideas that you have out of your head. Uh, it's, it's annoying, but I mean, it's just what it is. Yeah. I, I'm not sure if it was disparate realities or death in excess, but there were a lot of, uh, like cyber infighting hell knight fights, uh, like in a row, which I like those fights a lot. <laughs> it's like some of my favorite encounters of that, but I was thinking like, a, like having played, uh, like no SP2 and some of your later stuff, uh, there's like quite a lot of variance in the combat. Uh, so it was interesting to see that evolution of, like, ideas combat ways. Yeah, I I definitely, um, by the time I was doing No Speed 2, I was definitely thinking, like, okay, I did this earlier. Like, I had a fight with Pinky Demons and Manx or something, so I can't do that again later in the map. Or if I do it again, it has to be, like, after a couple more fights or something. So I, I do, like, try to vary things up a little bit, but uh sometimes that makes it difficult to make progress and if you're speed mapping like in no speed then that's almost impossible to do that all the time so yeah i mean i think it can work if uh it iterates i guess on the fight concept each time maybe like you know maybe you have a small scale encounter with some you know hell knights and cyber demons and then it scales up a bit or you know there are some like changing factors throughout or something like i definitely think you can still do that kind of thing but definitely i'm like I, okay i just use remnants and arch files i can't uh, which is like you know that's obviously the easy go-to but mm. you gotta avoid it sometimes yeah um, yeah i mean it's uh it does help if you just like vary the geometry make it more interesting or just different if then you might get away with being able to use like the same monster compositions it's not that big of a deal, but I try to avoid doing that if I can. Do you tend to make, uh, do you always have like encounters in mind for spaces or do you build spaces and then, uh, like deal with the encounters after or like, what's your process usually? Uh, it's kind of a mix. Some, sometimes I will make a whole map where I'm like, yeah, I know what each encounter is going to be and other times it will be like i don't know what any of this is going to be mm -hmm. but usually it's a it's a mix where it's like okay i know this room is going to have this kind of fight and the next room i'm not sure but i'll just deal with it and then i know what the room after that is going to have especially yeah. if i have like a very specific idea in mind then i know i'm working towards that but yeah it's just varies yeah i do think like a mix is usually a pretty good way to do it uh, because sometimes just 
kind of drawing lines and as long as you have like combat in your mind at the time like oh i'm gonna need some monster closets or some like pillars or whatever as long as you're like thinking about what could be in the spaces you're mapping then uh it's not as bad as just like i don't know <laughs> drawing a big circle that looks really cool and then being like well now i have a big circle to work with so <laughs> yeah it's it's difficult drawing a circle is really tempting but it's difficult to work with that in terms of making it an interesting fight because it's like well now i have to deal with the player circle strafing and that's a huge problem so yeah probably the biggest problem generally speaking for like slaughter map is making larger scale stuff anyway uh i noticed that you seem to change the blue range a lot uh, in the palette uh, your wads do you <laughs> do you not like the default blues in doom uh the default blues are fine it's just i just want to see different colors i guess that's pretty much it like in no sp two and three that palette came from a community project that never was oh, okay. uh, and i asked the person who was running it uh if i could use it and they said yes and so i just used it for two and three um and I made a map for that project, but it hasn't been released. But maybe in the future I will <laughs> release that with the same palette, so it'll be it'll be seen again. But yeah, I mean, usually it's not like oh, I hate blue. I just want to see a different one, I guess. Yeah, right. Uh, and speaking of community projects, you've taken part in quite a few of them, like uh, Hellforge map, which uh, Bloody Rust three as well. Which I, I mean, I think that was a community project. Uh. Do you find that they're like a pretty good way to like test out ideas uh, you don't want to use in your own projects and like uh, just get better at mapping in general or do you just use them as like an excuse to make something? Uh, I think they are a good way to get ideas out that you might not necessarily have wanted to use in your own stuff. But I also think like, because when I first joined, I think the first thing that I put out on uh, like as a release was a, a community project map for Eagle Mapping 2018 or something. Mm -hmm. I think I had two maps in that. And um, I saw that as a good way to just like kind of put something out there and like test the waters a little bit. And uh, so you can do that, but it's also a good way to just, if you have like an idea for a map, but you don't think it fits into anything, then yeah, I, I think it's a good way to do that as well. Mm-hmm. And do you usually speed map for those kinds of projects as well? Uh, not really. It just, if it turns out to be like I make it quickly, then that's just what happens. But I don't intentionally go at like a really fast pace for community projects. Right. How did, um, so how did No Reasons speed maps come about? Was this Todd inspired actually? Uh, from like, you know. The first one? yeah was it uh inspired by anything in particular like any other mapper or did you just feel like making speed maps oh uh, the idea itself not really i just kind of i saw nano wadmo happening and i was like i could probably do this right because i had been uh someone had called me a mapping machine before and i was like well let me let me test out how many maps that i can actually make in a month <laughs> this is a good way to do it um and so yeah i just sat down put on some metal and started mapping i think it was in november at the time this was before the month was standardized now it's like october every year but this was in november of 2019 and uh i was done in like 15 days so i was wow. like that was fun and i want to do it again so you know i waited like almost a whole year to do no sp2 <laughs> uh no sp1 has like a theme of like riffing on iwad maps I was wondering why you didn't sort of continue attempting that sort of theme for the other no SPs. Uh, well, I guess because I'd already done it. So I didn't really want to do it again. Okay. So you were basically just using like the, the iWood sort of themes as a like a foundation from which to build the speed maps. Uh, it wasn't like some kind of like, oh, I want to have a concept for every sort of speed mapping thing that I do. Yeah, I mean, back then it was just like, just kind of 
seeing what I could do, seeing what kind of crazy things I could come up with and uh, not um, not burn myself out, I, I guess. I just, I, I feel like it came out very well. And at, at the end of it, I wasn't really exhausted. So I was uh, pretty happy about that when I when I was done. Well, we'll get to exhaustion later, I, I think. Um, <laughs> with maybe some of the other ones. But uh, is do you think speed mapping is just your favorite way to to make maps? Uh no, I'm actually like I've sworn off speed mapping. At this oh point. okay, yeah. But uh, but that's just because I feel like there's so many things that I've wanted to do in some of those speed maps where I'm like I can't do it because I'm on a time constraint. So I just don't speed map because. There's so many times where I had to sacrifice an idea that I had because I just it would have taken too long. And I don't right. want to do that anymore. So Yeah. I mean that's definitely one of the big challenges with, with speed mapping. I uh, I don't do it a huge amount, but I've done it a little bit, uh working on a like a project that I'm doing now. And it's really good for like I don't know getting your like creative juices pumping or whatever like it for sure yeah because <laughs> you can just throw stuff down uh and then uh, it's a lot easier to like lead into doing sort of more detailed mapping and stuff but i think for me personally i prefer it as like using it as a base for something to complete uh afterwards i think rather than just uh make a speed map and then the map's done forever kind of thing Right. I mean, I I say I've sworn it off. Maybe one day, years from now, I'll get back to it. But uh, it it is really good at, at getting like, just putting stuff down and, yeah, getting those creative juices flowing, as they say. Yeah. I mean, I think I it always just allows you to have like a good starting off point because I just feel like when you have a blank grid in front of you, a lot of the time the hardest part of making a map is like drawing those first couple of lines and like trying to make a room out of them uh initially yeah i would definitely recommend people try it uh, it's just for me i probably went too hard on it it was like doing it every year you know year after year well, it's yeah. Like, yeah so like it's it's totally fine probably if you take longer breaks but i was just doing it too quickly so i mean you've why. made like what over 100 maps or something your speed uh, yeah at the like i think it's like 97 or 98 or something for just speed maps alone yeah which is ridiculous uh so you tend to use speed mapping as like a tool uh to be as productive as possible uh it's not <laughs> it's not just um it's not just like this is the only way i want to map kind of thing yeah mm -hmm. And uh, looking at your maps over the years, do you think, because playing disparate realities, like, that what isn't particularly hard uh, compared to your later stuff, do you think there's, like, a fairly linear difficulty curve in your wads? And do you think it's, like, attributable to you gradually getting better at the game yourself and wanting more of a challenge when you make stuff? I don't think there's a actually a, a linear difficulty curve, because a lot of people said no SP3 was easier than no SP2. Mm -hmm. And I tend to agree with that. Even after I buff the maps, it's still easier, in my opinion. Uh, but yeah, I do think a lot of the difficulty increasing does come from just getting better. Because I went back and replayed Disparate Realities not too long ago, and I found most of it was super easy. But yeah. back then, it was like pretty tough, and a lot of people told me it was really hard. I was like, I didn't... I mean, it was hard, but I didn't think it was like super hard. But now that I go back to it, it's like, this is actually really easy. So yeah. I do think there is that aspect of it for sure, where you do get better and you revisit stuff you made, and it's like this is actually pretty easy now. So, mm -hmm. which I guess is a good thing. But... Do you find that you want to keep increasing the difficulty, or are you kind of happy that maybe No SP three was like not as difficult as No SP two? Like, do you feel like maybe there's like you're starting to get to a point where you want like a bit of a middle ground or something where, uh maybe like fluidity of gameplay comes into into play a little bit and like maybe making save lists a little bit more accessible and, and stuff like that i do think about that more often like people doing demos because 
back then, I don't think anyone was ever going to demo any of my maps. Yeah. But now, a lot of people have, and so like I have to think about that way more. Because back then, it was just me like demoing my my own stuff most of the time. Like, no SP one, I demoed most of those maps, and um, I didn't really. Like Cosmogenesis, even then, I still wasn't thinking like, oh, someone's going to try to D2 all this. But people are telling me like, why'd you make it so hostile to a D2? I'm like, I didn't think anybody was ever going to try that. So, <laughs> yeah. you know, I do think about that more these days. Yeah, I was definitely the same. Like Breathless and Entropy, I mean, I was like, no one's ever going to do this. Like they're two they're gigantic maps. Like I built them with like saves in mind, essentially, because I was like, people just won't won't bother to do it because they'll be too long and and too difficult but then of course people came along and did do it and then uh obviously my latest stuff now i, I do try to think about speedrunners a little bit but uh still not a fan of like um trying to accommodate speedrunners too much <laughs> on any map i think yeah, like I yeah i think like a lot of it has to be like, the fun of speedrunning to me is seeing how people figure things out to make the map quick, rather than uh, it being sort of built around it to begin with. Yeah, I mean, I it's it's definitely a balance. Like, I, I don't want to make it for the speedrunners. I don't want to compromise on, like, an idea just because, oh, well, I want this to be done saveless. But I also yeah. have to think a little bit, like, is this too much? Like, I don't want to, I don't want to fall into like, oh, this is just way too much. Because sometimes you can do that for for saveless stuff pretty easily. Yeah, and it's uh, I mean, I could, I think it can also affect like design uh, in terms of like your layouts and and how you actually put the map together itself, which can sometimes be good because I think for speedrunning you tend to want to streamline a little bit. Um and sort of add into connectivity and make things flow a little bit better, which is obviously usually a pretty good thing uh, for mapping, but maybe it takes away, like, <laughs> sometimes you got to have, like, those giant TNT rooms that are completely pointless, you know? So Yeah. Although I don't know if you're a TNT fan. Uh, I like some of TNT. I don't hate it, but I don't really, I don't really play any of the iWatch, so to be fair, anymore, but yeah, T I never really got the the huge hate for for TNT. It was always just sort of whatever for me. I do feel like you're one of the slaughter mappers who uses hit scan uh, quite a lot, actually, uh, which is also maybe very time of deathy because uh, he quite likes hit scan. I, I like hit scan sometimes where it's like it presents more of a threat to you in like a huge space, mm -hmm. but. More and more these days, I'm finding that hit scan is just kind of annoying a lot of the time. Yeah, uh, and it can really like destroy the like the replayability of of an encounter, I guess. Yeah, I mean, it just makes it way more inconsistent most of the time. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You definitely have to be careful with it. I think it's yeah. I mean, that's why shotgunners are always like <laughs> kind of avoided. Yeah, I know uh, Bemuse loves his shotgun. <laughs> yeah. I think I think he tested um uh, I think it was map four of Fracture Worlds and he was pretty upset about the shotgunners. I think he took off a lot of points. I could imagine. I mean I try to use like masterbinds more, but just because they're severely underutilized by most people, I think. And I mean to be fair, you know, they do get stuck on one imp, but you know. I feel like they could be used more effectively to be an actual threat than just a joke. But sometimes I do put him in as a joke as well, because, I mean, it is funny. So Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, I definitely noticed your use of masterminds. Maybe more so in disparate realities, because they are just kind of, like, around a bit more. Uh, but I think in no SP2, actually, they're quite notable in a lot of the big open areas as, like, zoning tools, which uh, they're pretty good at uh and i think is like usually a pretty decent way to use them as long as you have like infighting that can kill them or you know like the right weapons for them so they're not like a grind mm -hmm. um 
So I, I guess I always think of you as like a pretty strong Doom player, even though I made a joke at the beginning that you were just okay. Uh, but you are actually very good at the game. Do you think of yourself as like a player or like speedrunner first, or do you think of yourself as like a mapper these days? Um, I think of myself just as a player uh, in terms of mapping, just because it's like, well, I'm going to play this map, so I want to be able to enjoy it. I'm not going to make yeah. something that it's like, well, I really hate this. So I I don't think of myself as a speedrunner because I'm the only thing I've ever run are like my own maps most of the time. So I would never call myself like, oh yeah, I'm a, I'm a speedrunner. Right. Like that's definitely more someone like Dubs or Four Shock real speedrunners. But me, it's just I sometimes run my own stuff, but that's about it in terms of speedrunning. Mm-hmm. Uh, so moving on to No SB Two, which um more speed maps uh i feel like it has like a bit more personality to it uh than the original at least in terms of you know you trying to like put more of a unique spin on the maps i guess there's like the tracker music uh the altered palette um the theming of the maps feels like quite a bit stronger was this just sort of like a natural evolution of your style or was there like a concerted effort to make something like bigger and better than the first no sp um i did definitely try to make it as uh, detailed and uh, epic, I guess, for lack of a better word, as I could. Uh, I definitely did want to make the maps more uh, interesting, uh, more involved than the like one room maps of the first one. But um, yeah, I felt like I don't have that many midis. At the time, I didn't have that many midis that I really wanted to use for like a whole megawatt. So I was like, what am I going to do? Because I want this to have custom music. So I went with trackers instead. I was like, a lot of these are pretty good. Uh, yeah. I feel like this is an underappreciated uh, type of music. So like you almost never hear trackers in Doom maps. I can think of a few examples, but it's it's um, few and far between. So I wanted to use those. And the palette, like I, I already explained, the palette was from a... yeah dead community project sadly and um some of the maps came from like i remade some very old maps that i had that were really bad and i was like how do i make these playable and so some of the maps like i think six or seven of the maps came from that where Mm -hmm. i remade very old maps i had made and tried to make them less bad right (laughs) uh but uh, a lot of the maps we're just like, how do I how do I make it bigger and better while not going too like I don't want it to be, uh, just bigger and better for the sake of it. I want it to actually be fun and interesting. So uh, that's kind of because I I had the idea for No SP two as soon as I finished the first one. I was like, I want to make something. I want to make another one, but I want it to be <laughs> more than the first one. Right. So I had a lot of ideas over the course of that year. Mm-hmm. And were there like uh, theming ideas you wanted to put throughout? Like, was there anything in particular that you were you were hoping to do in terms of like combat or, or design or anything? And the only thing I really thought about was the vials, the resurrecting yeah. everything vials. I had played Long Road No Turns by Benjo. Mm-hmm. I think it was early in 2020 or something like that. And uh, I really thought that that was just such a hilarious thing. And I thought it it could make for some really interesting moments. Um, So I knew I wanted to use that as well. So that's how that you can thank Benjo for for that nonsense. (laughs) Um, At least directly. I I think that came from somewhere else, but I got it from Benjo. I think you can thank Benjo for a lot of nonsense in Slaughter Woods, to be honest. So do you, so the tracking music you just sort of talked about, um, I think a lot of people maybe don't use tracker because they feel like it sounds like, uh, more external, I suppose. Like maybe MIDI sounds more integrated with the, like the gameplay sounds and stuff. So it sort of Mm -hmm. goes into the background and, and blends maybe a little bit more. Do you notice that with tracker, like, uh. Is that something that you actually prefer, is having the music feel, like, a little bit more external like that? Um, 
Not really. I never. I mean, I have thought about that, but it it was mostly just me wanting a source of music. Like I just, I just didn't have that many midis, and I was like, I know of this huge source of tracker music, the the mod archive, mm -hmm. and so I was like, let me just go through that and see what I can find. And I feel like, at least to me personally, it doesn't make that much of a difference. The only thing is that. Uh, metal and tracker is like a lot more rare than like midi metal right so a lot of the times it would affect kind of how the theme was where it's like this is just sort of like a almost feels like a techno theme or something like yeah that. that's what... like a, you know, so it's like a lot of the maps are just kind of like tech base or whatever and um there, there are fewer hell maps because most of the time I associate that with like metal or like dark brooding music and there's just less of that or not as much of it. Um, I didn't have as much of it back then. So, Yeah, I thought it was interesting you said that you were listening to metal when you made No SP because when I think of No SP 2, uh, not, I don't think of metal at all. Like uh, I do think of like, I don't know, it's got like some early 2000s like house vibes or <laughs> like techno vibes like you said yeah what's funny is a lot of that music is from like the late 80s or early 90s right right so the trackers were like written during that time some of them are from later some of them are from like the mid 2000s or something but yeah, most of them are quite old at this point i feel like the one i'm thinking of is that one in map 15 of no sp2 uh, the most yeah i think that one is i'm not sure but i think that one's from like the mid 90s wow like ahead of its time i'm on god track of music uh i definitely I, I remember we had a conversation where because i streamed osp2 uh i don't think i streamed all of it actually in discord and, and we talked a little bit about it while i was playing it um and i remember you saying that making the osp2 was like quite a bit less enjoyable than making the osp1 uh could you talk a bit about why uh, that was um, it was still enjoyable, but yeah, it was definitely less enjoyable because I had put so much expectation on myself, I guess. So it was like, I knew that I had to put all of this stuff together, all the resources, and I had to, uh, like make everything in a way that was, uh, that I perceived as being better than the first one. Um, and it just took so much more time and effort to make those maps. Like, I would sit down and spend all of my free time on those maps. Whereas the first one, it was like, I could sit there for 40 minutes and I'd be done with, like, two maps. Yeah. And and the second one, it was like, okay, I spent two days on one map. <laughs> Jesus. Uh, so I, by the time I was finished with that, I was satisfied but exhausted. Mm -hmm. And I wasn't really ready to do another one. Right. And what was the, like, comparative build time then overall? Because I think you said no SP was, like, 15 days or something. I mean, the second one took me the whole month, so... Yeah. Like, I was literally put, putting the finishing touches on it, like, at the very end of October. Mm -hmm. Well, so. the the other thing is that... um, I uh, The problem is, I think people maybe don't really think about it too much, but, like, when you... <laughs> like the more complex and the bigger your stuff gets like every aspect of the mapping process scales up uh, like encounter design becomes more intricate detailing becomes more intricate uh the layout itself usually uh you want to like make it more complex or make it sort of uh be feel like a bit more planned out or whatever and then on top of that like the testing process will usually take longer uh, as well so uh, I would imagine that like not only <laughs> were you trying to make these maps bigger and all this stuff but then you were probably doing a lot more play testing I would I would think yeah I mean on the topic of play testing people often say like oh these maps look so detailed and you know beautiful and whatever for a speed map and I'm like most of the time what I sacrifice in speed mapping is not necessarily the detailing or the layout or whatever, it's usually how intricately or how much that I play test the, the map. So each map in those P2 and 3, I played each of those at once through at least, but most of the time that was it. 
But usually for something that's not a speed map, like in Death and Excess or uh, other things, I I play test much more thoroughly. Mm -hmm. It's like I'm playing like one fight for like six hours trying to make sure it's perfect. <laughs> Or perfect yeah. as how I wanted, but in no SP two and three, it was like, okay, I play this is beatable. Uh, time to move on. It's <laughs> like you just don't have that much time to to do that. Yeah. Uh, well, the other thing is that like no SP one, I feel like a lot of those maps are like one encounter and then you're done. Like it'll be so like you yeah. probably have the ability to make sure those encounters individually were maybe a bit more polished. Yeah, those were a lot easier because they were just so much shorter. Whereas two and three, it's like I have to play a whole map for like forty minutes, and you know, but after I'm already done spending, you know, twelve hours on making the map, so it's like I got to rush. Mm -hmm. I did want to talk uh, <laughs> specifically about a pretty notorious fight in OSP two, uh, the map fifteen secret exit fight. Uh, what made you want to like create that that encounter and, and what was the testing process like for that one um so there's a map in no sp1 that is just a giant hallway of cyber demons yeah and no sp2 map 15 is kind of a an upgraded version of that the secret fight is um so i kind of just wanted to reference that but the the testing was like uh, it, it took a while. It was probably the longest part of making that map because, uh, well, everything else is pretty easy compared to that. But it wasn't like, oh, yeah, I'm going to beat the whole thing saveless multiple times. It was like, how long did this take me? Did it take me, like, you know, a whole day to beat or just a few hours? And and since, I don't remember exactly since this was, like, two years ago, but I don't think it took me that long to beat it. So I figured, like, oh, it's probably okay. But, I, you know, I did use, like, probably a mid-save or something. so. Well, yeah. But I, but I wasn't going for, like, oh, this is, I can do this, you know, save list perfectly. Like, it's the speedrunner thing we were talking about where it's like I didn't really take into account that anybody would ever try to run that map. So. Yeah. <laughs> like Vile, for yeah. instance. Were you yeah, there for the stream where Vile, uh, where Vile played it for the first time? And he ended up just sort of doing that fight, like, over and over again. Yeah, I think so. I mean, I've seen everybody, like, break on that fight. I've seen Vortail do it. I've seen Medi do it. I've I've seen a bunch of people play that. Me as well, yeah. I did it too. I actually recently uh, demoed that map just to like, you know, prove to people that I can do. So. Well, that's the thing with your stuff is that I never, I never question whether you can do it or not. I'm like, yeah, he can obviously beat this. Um, a lot of people do though. Some people are like, oh, he's a, you know. A... <laughs> He's a sadist who wants to see people suffer. But I mean, obviously that's not true. I just want to make stuff that I enjoy. Yeah, I can't say I've ever made a fight that I, like, that I couldn't beat, and I was like, this is fine anyway. <laughs> I don't think you ever have that feeling as a mapper. Like, yeah, I mean, obviously if there's a fight where it's like, I actually can't beat this, I just nerfed it. Yeah. <laughs> it's like just... the pretty much the first part of the, the mapping process. Like, usually I will make something as hard as I can make it, and then I will scale it back. That's, like, usually the way that I map. Yeah, that was the one thing that I really made sure of in, in OSP2 as best as I could, was, like, if something was actually just impossible for me, <laughs> I would just nerf it. Yeah. So there's nothing in there where it's like, wow, I actually can't beat this. Oh, well, I'm just going to leave it that way. I mean, first and foremost, I mean, when you're making maps, it's to play yourself. Uh, at least for me, like, I'm just making yeah. stuff that I think is, like, interesting and, and uh, that I want to play. So, you know, why are you going to make something <laughs> just to annoy other people? Yeah, that's the same thing for me. It's like, I don't, I don't even think really about other people, like, how they're going to enjoy it, or at least I didn't used to. Now it's like, I kind of think a little bit more about it, because I know more people play my stuff. But it's still mostly, like, what do I want to see? What do I want to play? It's not like, and it's definitely nothing to do with like, oh, I want to annoy this person because that's yeah. just a waste of time. Yeah, exactly. Do you find that like with speed mapping, it can be a bit more enjoyable, uh, like play testing encounters and stuff? Because uh, a lot of the time I found with speed mapping is that like, I mean, you don't have time to like make like a, <laughs> a perfect encounter that's like totally balanced or whatever. A lot of the time it's like, 
throwing a bunch of monsters in a space and then like you might have had a couple of ideas while you're building the area uh but then when you get to the playtesting part it's like almost like a surprise as to like what's going to occur i guess i actually that's actually totally true for me is um it's uh, kind of exciting where it's like you just make some like random shit in an encounter it's like okay i have no idea what's going to happen here so let me test it and see <laughs> Yeah. See what happens. And sometimes you find like, oh, this is actually really fun. And sometimes it's like, okay, this is impossible. So I gotta I gotta do something to nerf it. But yeah, I mean, sometimes you don't know what you're gonna get. And I think that's kind of exciting to uh try to figure out. Yeah. I mean, you have that opposite end of the spectrum, I guess, as well. That's that can be equally exciting where it's uh a very mechanically like tight fight and you want it to be exactly a certain way and then uh, through the playtesting you get to like iterate and then make it better and better and you watch it evolve into like exactly what what you imagined i think that's also like very good but on on like the complete opposite end of the spectrum to like speed map yeah i kind of wanted to do more of that which is why i've stopped speed mapping is right. because i wanted to make those kinds of fights and i you just can't really do it when you're speed mapping where you balance everything tightly and everything's just as you wanted yeah I, I think especially if you're working with like like boom mechanisms uh and things like that where you need maybe a little bit of pre-planning for like voodoo stuff uh not very conducive to uh speed mapping i agree unless you're like rubix or something because rubix will just be like i don't know he'll have like some idea and then he'll be like oh, I, like, threw this together in, like, 10 minutes, and he will have, like, lured, like, 500 voodoo closets that that do, like, 300 triggers all at once or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know. Yeah, I mean, I, Rivix is uh, crazy. Like, I heard from, from Bemused once that he draws all of his rocks by hand, like, all the curvy, perfect rocks by hand, and I, I was like, yeah, really? That's, that's insane. Same with uh, Tourniquet. Tourniquet also does, he does all his lighting gradients, uh, and he doesn't use stair builder tool for anything. If you look at my asthma, every gradient on that map is uh, done by hand. Yeah, that's insane. Like I draw rocks and stuff by hand, but when I need like gradients and stuff, I'll just stair build it. Like, yeah, I still, bu- well, I still I build. I couldn't it a fathom lot, yeah. doing it. Yeah, I, <laughs> I still, I couldn't fathom like trying to do all that by hand. I would go crazy probably. Well, the reasoning that I've heard is that stair builder is like pretty imperfect in terms of angles and stuff. So the more you use it, uh, like it, it's always slightly off, uh, off the grid. Yeah. I suppose. Yeah. Yeah. It, it, obviously, doing it by hand gives you more precision for what you want. So I can understand that. Yeah. But I just don't think I would have the patience to do that all the time. Sometimes I'll find like, okay, I can't stair, stair build this perfectly, so I'll, you know do what i can to like draw a gradient by hand or whatever but it's not something that i often do it's very rare that i have to do that yeah i think these days i have like a bit of a middle ground where i'll often stair build and then uh tweak the gradients a lot <laughs> to make them like fit slightly better but uh for me it's like uh i don't know i'm not i'm not interested in like why create more work for myself that's unnecessary i guess because it's not necessarily the fun part doing like the busy work aspects of it so it feels like you're setting arbitrary restrictions for yourself that aren't necessarily going to help your creative process but um with rubix and tourniquet i think they both have a very specific reason why they do it and uh you know that's one thing but uh just to just to like blankets say that stair builder is like cheating or whatever i you know i don't know that i would necessarily agree right uh so no sp2 uses like a lot of d hack changes which you didn't necessarily have in your earlier stuff like death and excess do you feel um that there are like gaps in the sandbox that you wanted to fill in doom or like things you didn't like about the weapons or was it just sort of uh, trying to make the wad feel more unique. Um, I just kind of wanted to, I guess, mess around. Like, I just wanted to try different stuff. And um, I, I don't know if it was necessarily about making it feel more unique. It was just kind of, I wanted to see how this would change the gameplay. 
So, you know, the side bruisers and the vials and stuff, all of that is pretty easy to do, but it changes the gameplay a lot. Like, you can't just kill vials and forget about them. You have to, like, worry, like, <laughs> or cyber demons or mm -hmm. anything like that, where it's like, okay, where are these cybers? Like, the vials aren't going to come through here and, like, resin, right? So, like, it, it changes things a lot like that. And you can't just rush huge vial hordes sometimes. And um, you can use the, the cybersers as a smaller cyber demon to pack a punch, but they take up much less space. So I find that so interesting to use as well. Mm -hmm. So it wasn't necessarily, like, I feel like there's, like, a tanky mid-tier like with high damage that's missing or, or like something specific it was just sort of you wanted to mix up gameplay a little bit and this was a way to do it yeah kind of i mean the cybers there was a little bit more like that where it's like i kind of wanted like i said like a mini cyber demon that can you can put in more places and pack the same amount of damage um so the players a little bit more on their toes uh, mm -hmm. as for the the ammo stuff um it was mostly just the BFG where I just wanted more ammo for like BFG spam stuff. Yeah. Um, the other stuff was just kind of gratuitous and like yeah, I'll just give you more ammo for whatever. Right. Just because, just because I can. Was like specific ammo balancing something you thought about, uh, really, or or do you think like because a lot of it is macro slaughtery, you just wanted the player to have enough ammo at all times, kind of thing. Uh, yeah. I didn't really think that much about uh, ammo balancing because uh, it's a speed map, so you can't worry that much about it. But uh, I, it was more like, like you were saying, just making sure the player has enough ammo. Yeah. Uh, so map 31 of NoSP2, platforming map. Uh, it's not super difficult or anything, but I thought it was interesting that you included it. There's like a, a little bit of platforming throughout your... Your wads usually. Uh, do you consider yourself somebody who enjoys platforming? Uh, uh yeah, I do. Right. I find that uh, like platforming tends to like crop up a lot in slaughter and challenge content. Maybe more so these days. I feel like it's gotten like a little bit more prevalent. Do you think people just sort of naturally start to enjoy like the movement mechanics of platforming as they get better at the game? Uh, I'm not sure. For me, it was like. I was influenced by uh, Jump Maze, which is like a Xandro jump, jumping wad right. sort of thing, where it's like you're actually jumping across platforms and stuff like that. And um, obviously, Sunder had a lot of platforming. And so that kind of influenced me to, to put platforming in my own stuff. Um, but yeah, I do kind of enjoy just like mostly when you're going across a lot of platforms and you make it. And you see, like, just how far you went. It's pretty satisfying to to be able to make all of those gaps. Um, I don't know about these days. I feel like there's a lot of people, a lot more people making platforming stuff. So, mm -hmm. obviously, you see it a lot more just because uh, there's been, like, an explosion in the, the challenge community, I guess. Yeah, for sure. So, I can't speak for, for what everyone enjoys, but that's how I see it. You do seem to, like, make your platforming sections, like, more isolated uh, as well. Like, not necessarily uh, platforming-based content, uh, combat, sorry. I think there's, like, a couple of times where you do do that, but you prefer to have platforming as, like, its own separate thing to maybe break up combat a little bit? Usually that's how I do it, yeah. But uh, recently I've been putting some, like, platforming with combat just to mix things up a little bit, I guess for my own sake but yeah usually that comes from like playing jump maze or something where it has long stretches of just platforms mm -hmm. so i kind of have that in my mind or like just a long hallway with a bunch of platforms or something that's kind of what uh no sp2 map 31 is anyway and more and like to... oh sorry you go. i was just gonna say and it's a way to break up the like huge slaughter fucked up maps from each other <laughs> yeah so, you, and, and like, you prefer, I guess, like, the more free-flowing kind of platforming that's more momentum-based rather than um, super pri uh, precise SR50s and, and looking at the mini-map to make a jump and stuff like that, I guess. Yeah, yeah, I really don't uh, enjoy that sort of thing. Yeah. To me, that's kind of tedious, but that's just me. Mm-hmm. 
I feel like every slaughter map had probably has like one gigantic map in them. Was Cosmogenesis something you'd wanted to make for a really long time? A map like that, yeah. Because I had played Holy Hell a little bit, and um, I played Oki Uh But those maps are often criticized for being grindy, and Oki Plot in particular for being kind of bullshit in terms of difficulty. Right. Uh, just because it doesn't give you a lot of health. And um, so I kind of wanted to make a map that felt like this big adventure slaughter thing that was actually kind of fun, at least for me. Because I, I didn't really enjoy Holy Hell that much. It's really grindy. And Oki Plot uh, is just tiresome. Right. So I kind of wanted to make something like that, but for myself, I guess. Mm -hmm. I was going to ask, actually, as a bit of a fan of Holy Hill myself, uh, do you, well, you talked, you also talked about playing Long Road No Turns. I was wondering if you actually, like, enjoyed Grind as part of gameplay, at least uh, to a certain extent. I used to. I used to enjoy Grind quite a bit. Um, like, if you look in Disparate Realities, like, Map 5, I think, has this huge grindy fight with Hell Knights mm -hmm. in one of the sections. And it's just like you're sitting there rocketing them for, like, 20 minutes. <laughs> and um, so I used to enjoy sort of stuff like that, but I think as I've uh, made more maps and played more Doom, it's kind of it's kind of run its course for me. So I do less of that these days. But every now and then, there's a little bit of grind that I enjoy, but it's it's not nearly as much as it used to be. Right. Was the palette for Cosmogenesis made before you started making the wad, or did it come later on in the project? Uh, it was it was before I even started making that map. Okay. So all the texturing and everything, uh, you had considered the palette, like, but was it, like, actually sort of like a driving force behind the map, or was it like, oh, I'm making a new ward, I would like a new palette for it kind of thing? So the story of Cosmogenesis is a little complicated. Mm -hmm. uh, basically, I was making a, a wad after Death in Excess, and it was going to have 20 maps. And I think I started making that in early 2020. So... Um, that got interrupted by no sp2 and i came back to it later started making more maps and at some point i started making the penultimate map map 19 mm -hmm. and that's what later became cosmogenesis uh, i was like i want this map to be you know pretty big and and uh, crazy but uh, it started outgrowing far exceeding what that project was supposed to be about so i was like okay this is too much so i have to take this out and uh, make it its own thing since I, I was like, maybe I'll just make this a, like an OP block, holy hell sort of thing instead, since these ideas are so grand at this point. Mm -hmm. So I took the, the palette from that old project I was working on and the textures, and um, I knew I wanted it to have like a like alien world sort of feeling at the start, where you're like working backwards from uh, what you would normally be going through in progression. Like normally you'd like start on Earth and go to some weird hellish stuff. So I wanted to like work backwards from that. So you like kind of start in a more hellish place and then work your way towards Earth. Um, so yeah, I took all of the the textures in mind for that. I was like, okay, so I, I want there to be like a you know alien pink sky for the start of it, and you know, it, it you eventually make your way to Earth and everything's kind of you know normal mm -hmm. at that point. Wow, I didn't realize there was such deep lore behind Cosmogenesis' story. Yeah, that's actually not the full story, but that's the, the basic gist of it. Yeah, well, what's the full story? Uh, the full story includes uh, my motherboard dying in the middle of making that map. <laughs> so... I think I remember this <laughs> happening, actually. Yeah, this was in uh, like mid-2021. Uh, you know, so that happened, and... Uh, so while I was waiting for a motherboard, I was like, I want a map, but I can't work on this map because I was stuck on a laptop. And um, this laptop couldn't even run the old outdated version that I had on Dropbox in the editor. So I was like, I can't even work on Cosmo at this point. So I think at the time, uh, Pookers was happening. And I was like, I'll make a map for this. So it's good timing. So that took like a couple weeks. And then... 
I was done with that, and then you know, motherboard came in, and I was back on my normal PC, so I could start working on it again. And uh, that's the the full lore, <laughs> I guess. Well, I feel like you could have maybe uh, made separate encounters or something, and then glued them into the map later, potentially. I could have, but I was just so so frustrated by what was happening <laughs> yeah. that I just didn't even want to look at it. I was like, because the, the version I had on my Dropbox that I backed up was so much older than the one that I had been working on. And I was like, Jesus, why did I not <laughs> back right. this up more often? So, you know, I, yeah. I was just like demotivated to work on it at that point until I got my computer fixed. So. Yeah, I had a lot of similar things with Fractured Worlds where I kept <laughs> I kept moving between working on a PC and a laptop and I was also using Dropbox, so I would have like one version on the PC, one on Dropbox, and then a different version on the laptop, and I had to work out sometimes like which fucking version was actually the correct one. It was very annoying. Yeah. Uh, I think Rubix had to build like a reject table for Cosmogenesis, right? Because um, yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was so gigantic. What, what kind of issues were you, were you running into building a map of that size? Um, it was just lag, really. Like, mm -hmm. it just could barely run the full version. So I had to split it up. And then at some point, Bemuse told me, like, oh, Rubix made a reject table, right? I never asked Rubix to do that. But he just did it because he's a, a cool guy. And I was like, oh, wow, thanks. And uh, so, you know, that's how, that's basically how that happened. I actually had nothing to do with the reject table. Yeah, I think maybe Bemuse asked him about it. Uh, but more generally speaking, like, oh, is there anything you could do with a map of this size to make it run better or whatever? And I, I think Rubix suggested that. And then, as he always does, he just did it because he's a, just a helpful dude. Yeah. So it was mostly just the, the lag, but there are some other issues. Like, um, if you're on one side of the map, you'll be able to hear, like, crushers on the other side of the map, for example, or monsters on the other side of the map, stuff like that. But, um, I'm not really sure how to fix stuff like that, but the reject mm -hmm. table definitely did help with the lag. Like, it's actually playable, the full version now, so... I was under the impression that sounds like crushes and things, uh, they... So they emanate from their original point, but it, let's say you have them tied to another sector, like a control sector, the sound will originate from uh, the middle point between those two sectors. So I'm not sure if maybe you just had some crushes that uh, were tied to a control sector and then the middle point was where you were hearing them, because that could just be what it was. Uh, I'm not sure. But yeah, if you want to make, you can make like totally silent ones by putting like uh, control sectors off the map all the way in a spot where uh, the middle point will never be close to the player kind of thing. But Well, I mean, this was, I'm talking about like, so you'd be like 30,000 units away from the crusher and you'd be able to hear it. Oh, okay. That's what yeah. I mean. That's Maybe, so uh... Like, huge sound bugs. Okay, yeah. So kinda, it's kind of the thing where, like, with monsters that I think uh, Insane Gazebo was having in map 18 of Sunder, mm -hmm. where he would have... You'd be able to hear monsters from, like, some random place as if they were right next to you, even though they were really far away. Right. So it was, it was that kind of issue. Yeah, it must be some weird nerd building error with the sound or something strange uh i know yeah so you talked about this before actually uh because you used to speed run your maps and <laughs> i was gonna ask you if you thought about the fact that anybody might run cosmogenesis because i remember watching ankelagon uh running that map and were there like any concessions taken <laughs> for that um no, I mean I still speed run my maps every now and then, but it's not a like I don't speed run all of my maps. I just don't have that much time or patience. <laughs> but um, yeah, for Cosmogenesis, I didn't think anybody would ever try to run that map, so I didn't really think that much about like, oh, maybe speedrunners are going to be annoyed by this or that. It was just uh, like, what what idea do I have for this fight? Okay, let's do it then and see how doable it is. And I didn't have trouble with most of those fights mm -hmm. so i never thought most of them would be a problem but you know that's mapper's bias yeah right yeah it is kind of crazy how like i'm you know i'm a decent player but i wouldn't consider myself like a top player or anything but 
when you make something yourself, you tend to like outperform anyone blind. <laughs> yeah. Like, well, I'm kind of the same way. I consider myself above average, but I would never compare myself to someone like Incaligon or yeah, uh, someone like that or Vile. Like these players are far above my own skill level, so in my opinion, anyway. Yeah. So when you what like you get them to test your stuff and you see them die, you're like, well, <laughs> maybe it needs a bit of a nerf here. Then, like right now, I have um, <laughs> like Dubs and Nev testing stuff for me. So, again, two very good players. Players that I think are better than I am. And uh, so, you know, when I see them struggle with something, it's like, okay, maybe I should nerf this. Yeah. I have, like, quite a big group of testers, usually. I And most of them are usually, like, pretty good players, but I will try to get, like, some newer players, uh, especially to test, like, Hey Not Too Rough and, and stuff now that I, like, care a bit more about difficulty settings. Um... Do you find that like you're actually paying attention to difficulty settings these days, or are you pretty much like a just focused on UB? Um, I when I was speed mapping, I didn't because well, you don't have time for that. But when I'm not speed mapping, I do try to pay attention to difficulty settings, like for disparate realities and death and excess. Those both have difficulty settings, uh, and but for Cosmogenesis, I just didn't even think anybody would bother with anything other than uv so i didn't bother with that but most of the time i if i'm not uh, speed mapping i do try to take that into account like there's a, a wad i'm making now where i'm dreading to do it but i'm going to have difficulty settings in there and i'm yeah. going to try to make it better than death and excess and despair realities because those were criticized for having lazy difficulty settings so i'm going to yeah. try not to be lazy with those yeah it's uh it's definitely difficult, I mean, uh, especially if you are putting in, like, platforming and stuff, and then if you want to make that easier, you got to do a bunch of voodoo stuff to, to sort of um, shift the map around a little bit, but it, it can be quite satisfying, I suppose, that you just hope that people will actually play it on the lower difficulty settings. Yeah, I mean, I suspect no one will play this one on lower setting, but I'm doing it just in case, you know. <laughs> And that way I can say, okay, look, if it's too hard, you can just bump it down a little bit. But no one will will do that, but hey, no. I can try. You did your best. Yep. Uh, do you think there's, like, another gigantic map in you, or was Cosmogenesis it? Um, maybe. I, I feel like I could probably make something like that again. Maybe not like that, but something huge, but probably different from that. Not, like, a epic adventure thing. But I don't know. We'll see. You and Dubs can collab on one now that he's finished his other one. Finally. <laughs> yeah, maybe one day. It's funny, we haven't actually ever uh, collabed on any map. The Dream Team. I think it would be good. It would be uh, too difficult for anyone to play, probably, but <laughs> I'm sure. <laughs> maybe, maybe one day. We'll see. Who knows? Uh, so no SP three uh, kind of iterates again uh, on no SP two, obviously with its with its gameplay and then the D hacked as well. Uh, what did MBF twenty one bring to the table for you, and how did it like influence and counter design in that one? Um, so no SP three was sort of like an experiment in D hacked for me, just actually learning D hacked because no SP two. Most of that I didn't actually do. Like some of it I did do, like the rocket launcher and the ammo and stuff. But mm. most of it was like either like just ripped it from another wads, or I had somebody else like help me with it. So for No Speed Three, it was like most of the new stuff I did, like all the new stuff I I just did myself. Like I took the, I looked at the Mister X uh, D hack from Side Two, and I was like, okay, how do I put this on like an object? that I can use without sacrificing like a monster or something since mm -hmm. you can just have all sorts of stuff with uh, MBF 21. And I did that with the astral cacodemon and the, the rocket caco as well. And um, so a lot of that was just me like learning dehacked. That's kind of what I was doing it for. And um, so I was like, if I can't figure out how to do this, I'm just not going to make anything, but I think it was like September 30th or something. I was 
messing around with that and I finally got it to work. So I was like, I guess I'm making a, another no SP <laughs> just, right. to, just, just to mess with this dehacked. So that's mostly what it was about. was just like trying to, to learn that. And, uh, but I, I did, you know, have some ideas as well for, for that one, but a lot of it was just like, I feel like I sacrificed on some of those maps more than I wanted to. So that's kind of why I stopped speed mapping because uh, there was a lot of that in that lot mm -hmm. in terms of mapping ideas. And did you, so did you use Whackhead or Whacked or whatever the hell it's called? Yeah, yeah. Okay. I did. I'm assuming since then you've uh, heard about like Decker Hack uh, and stuff, right? Yeah, I've heard about all the, the yeah. Doom Tools stuff, or whatever that's called, but I've never used any of it so. Okay. I mean, at the time, I think that was already out. I just never bothered to use it because uh, I don't know. <laughs> I was lazy. I right. had to use what I what I knew. So. Well, Decker hacked is uh, quite a bit easier, I will say, than than using Wacket probably. Uh, once you get used to it, anyway, because Decorate is uh pretty. Uh, I don't know. It looks like just real language. Like it's not. It's. Not too complex, I suppose, code, code wise. Yeah, I should have a look at that at some point. I'm just, yeah, lazy, like I said. Yeah. I, I was just thinking if you were getting a bit burnt out with the D hack stuff, maybe that would, uh, maybe that would help streamline things a bit. Um. So, how much more work was was no SP three then compared to two? Was it more work, or did you find it like a bit easier to put together? It was the same amount, I would say. It's just. My attitude was different. For OSP2, I was like really motivated to make all those maps. For three, it was like, well, I guess I'm gonna make these maps. Right. But I was I wasn't like super excited, super ready to make those maps. I just kind of did it. So by the end of that, I was super tired, but I wasn't even like happy about it like I was at the end of OSP2. <laughs> I was just I was just like, thank God this is over. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> I'm not doing this again. Oh, no. So emotionally, it's been kind of a downward spiral for no SP over the years. Yeah, I guess so, yeah. I mean, you know, it's all a hobby thing, so... But I, it was like, well, I'm not really enjoying this anymore, so I'm just going to stop. I'll just do normal mapping instead. Mm -hmm. I mean, you do so. tend to, like, put quite a lot of pressure on yourself. Uh Like, generally speaking, in terms of, like, with each subsequent release, it's like, well, this one has to be better than the last thing I put out, and, and especially, like, if you're making, like, the original fun of No SP must have been that you could, like, just slap these maps together really quickly, and, and now each time it's, like, well, the process is getting longer and <laughs> more difficult. Yeah. So. yeah, it's, like, I might as well not be speed mapping at this point. I'm just destroying my motivation to make maps. And I, I think I said that, I've said this before, where if there is a No SP 4, it will just be, like, No SP 1. Because right. that was way more fun to do than two or three, where it's like, I just make whatever. And it's like one room of RNG bullshit that you can get away with because the map is like two minutes short. Yeah. Two minutes long, yeah, yeah. I think you could probably... Um, I Like, I think you could probably still make it feel... Um, like, more unique and, and like you, you're doing something like new and exciting and, and still bigger and better in various ways without it actually being physically bigger and better anyway like as long as you've got like a strong theme and you know strong encounters and things like that like maybe smaller but more polished stuff you know maybe that could be your goal rather than simply sort of uh larger scale or, or like more encounters or, or whatever it may be yeah maybe i could I, like, I know a lot of people liked uh, Map 26 of No Speed 2. I could mm -hmm. make stuff like that, where it's, like, still custom textures, still custom music, but the maps are shorter, but more lethal. Um, yeah. And not, like, so huge and grandiose and stuff like that. Just make Map 15 Secret Exit fight uh, over and over again, but it gets longer. No, I can do that again. <laughs> <laughs> I did that again for No SP3. I can't do it anymore. I'm done. Okay. <laughs> just make it the whole one uh, at this point. Yeah, no, it's just uh, No SP4, No SP2, Map15. It's going to be the name of it. I, I noticed that... Uh, well, it said the Pugas was for 2022. Uh, 
on the Doom Wiki. Maybe that's incorrect. I don't know. It had it listed as after Cosmo, but I guess you said that uh, you made it. Uh, is it just because it got released later? I guess. Yeah, it got released like February twenty twenty two. But it was uh, it was a thing in twenty twenty one. Like, but it was being worked on then. But it just it just wasn't done for a while. So, I think I was like the first or second person done with a map in that project. So I, it was pretty early on. Right. And it also, the 30 Monsters Community Project, I noticed. Was that something you worked on this year, or, or was that was that also, like, a late release? That was, like, December of 2021? Okay. Or something? Um, yeah. But it released sometime this year. I don't even remember. It was, like, a few months ago or something. So you have, like, a... Do you have, like, a larger project in the works right now? You were sort of talking vaguely about something you were working on. Uh, I do have a project. I don't know how large it would be considered. It's just like seven maps. It's not that big. Mm -hmm. Some of the maps are pretty big, but uh, yeah, it's just a a little thing to get back into mapping, I guess, and try to flesh out some ideas instead of just rushing through stuff like I have for the last three years. Right. So people can probably expect something maybe more in the vein of death and excess, but but a bit more polished, I guess. Um, yeah. And no sure. speed maps. <laughs> no speed maps. <laughs> no. Uh, well, uh, I guess this will be um the final question then, the big one, which uh, I think you said you listened to the the Sandy episode, so you've at least heard this this once. But uh, what is your favorite Doom monster, and why? Um, Cyber Demon, for sure. Finally, <laughs> someone with taste. I Look mean, it's it. just—it's so exciting to play with a Cyber Demon. Like, it just does so much damage. There's just a huge threat factor there, and uh, yeah, I mean, obviously, for me, that's the the big draw is just how much of a threat the Cyber can be. Obviously, if you have a huge space, it's not going to be that threatening. But you have to to know how to use it in a big space or in a small space, and uh, it can be really fun for me anyway to have that threat of just a rocket in your back <laughs> if you're not paying attention. Yeah, they're also, I mean, they're just very versatile. Uh, like they don't seem like they should be on paper because they're just, I mean, they're like a big imp that shoots three projectiles almost, like <laughs> like most of the Doom One enemies, which are kind of just various sizes of imps yeah. but uh something about like the rhythm of the them shooting the rockets uh and then uh you know things like mechanical things like being able to two shot them with the bfg and then infighting uh, from a mapping perspective obviously makes them like incredibly fun yeah. yeah it's um yeah just because there's so many like their mechanics are like perfect intentional or not like the two shotting like you said it's it's great to have like this huge threat that you can just if you know what you're doing you can neutralize very quickly and um it feels satisfying to do something like that in a like a hard fight where it's like okay this thing could kill me in like a one hit but uh you know i know how to move so it's not that big of a deal mm -hmm. and obviously you know everybody likes how how chiseled the cyber demon is at least that's uh... <laughs> yeah <laughs> obviously a huge factor in whether you use them or not have you considered using the like the baby cybers do you do you like them or do you prefer the like the cyber bruises or whatever that, that you tend to use oh, you mean like being? the the low health cyber demons yeah yeah no i've never really used one i mean uh well, i guess i kind of did map which too but they still mm -hmm. had like a lot of health but i don't know i mean it's just um it feels a little redundant to me because they're the same size. I mean, the thing is, is that you can fit the cybers in so many more areas than the cyber demon because they're so much right. smaller. So I, I like that aspect of cybers just more than the low health cybers. Just make all but your maps one twenty eight by one twenty eight all the time. <laughs> yeah, it's not like there's anything wrong with using them. I just prefer the to have the uh, that little difference where you can stick a cybers in a tiny closet. Mm -hmm. something just kills you instantly <laughs> yeah uh the ones 
Uh, I know that you nerfed them, right? Between was it between OSP two and three? You nerfed them, so yeah, yeah, because God, <laughs> the ones in OSP two, that firing animation is like a one hundredth of a second or something. Yeah, that's why I did it because I had some people, you know, complaining about that. So I was like, I'll I'll extend their their firing animation a little bit so you can actually like react to it. Because before it was like if they shoot at you right. Like they're right in front of your face. It's like you can't even react. You're just gonna take that hit. You have to already be moving. Yeah, <laughs> definitely had a few moments with them where I where I was upset. But uh, you know, you live and learn with these mm-hmm. things. Well, um, thanks for coming on. It was great to talk to you. Uh, I had I had already talked to you, I guess, like a little bit when I was like playing through NoSP and stuff. So I already knew you had like some interesting things to say about about these wads. But I think people will be interested to hear about because you're one of the most like speed mapping heavy uh, people I know in in the community, especially in like the slaughter scene. So I think it's kind of interesting to have like a unique perspective on speed mapping and what it does to a human being, uh, <laughs> basically. Yeah, I mean, I don't think it's like, you know, I, I like I said, I encourage people to to try speed mapping. It is a great way to just get stuff out there and and be done with stuff. But at the same time, uh, take breaks. You know, yeah. <laughs> don't, don't burn yourself out. Like maybe don't make thirty two maps in a month. Oh, yeah, I mean, if you get a speed map, you know, you can make like five maps or six maps or two yeah. maps or whatever. You know, not thirty two or thirty four or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, well, I mean, it worked out anyway because uh, the wads are really fun to play through, really, really unique feel. And I think what I appreciate about your maps is that uh, I feel like as I've been playing more and more, I'm I've started to miss like that feeling of like a loose slaughter gameplay. Like everything, including my own stuff, is like very tight. It feels like these days and uh, more combat puzzly. So I do enjoy playing through like more kind of sprawling uh slaughter experiences that uh maybe offer like a little bit more freedom gameplay wise yeah there's a lot of that these days the the tight encounters and there's nothing wrong with that i think that's that's very good and uh it can be really fun but um as i've played more i kind of enjoy that less and less so it's just not really what i make them often mm-hmm. but um you know with the challenge community kind of exploding recently there's way more people there than there used to be um, I feel like that's happening more. So um, I was always kind of inspired more by like Armored Blood and like Speed of Doom and stuff like that, the more open yeah. stuff and the architecture of like Sunder and stuff. So I guess, you know, I, I've been more interested in the open gameplay more. Mm-hmm. Um, that's about it. It's not, I, I, it's not like I have anything against uh, the, the tight setups or anything. It's just, I just prefer the, the open loose gameplay. Yeah, well, I mean, like I said, I'm glad that there are people who do still, because I think you need, like, a good mix, usually. I think, like, Hard Fest seemed pretty encouraging in that regard. Uh, that one, There were, like, quite a lot of maps that looked, like, pretty pretty loose, and <laughs> it had, like, real early Slaughter Fest vibes, which I thought was cool. Yeah, I heard about that one. I haven't, I haven't played it, but maybe I should give it a go at some point. Yeah. There's too much content out there usually to play when it comes to Doom. Yeah, there is a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah. There's a lot of stuff I should play, but uh, yeah, thanks for, for having me on, man. It was uh, fun. Yeah, it was really good. Uh, thanks for agreeing to come on. And uh, maybe uh, maybe in the future, we'll have you back. Sounds good. All right. Catch you later. Uh, I'll be back with uh, another guest next week, I suppose. Uh, so, goodbye.